I'm Zach Rosenberg, founder of Do Good By Us, as Megan mentioned. And if you didn't know I was from Do Good By Us, you could probably tell from my shirt, my shoes, my bracelet, or whatever else that you care to peer at. Today we're going to be talking about making small changes every day. And this is something that I learned in the hardest way possible, at least through business. Um, I am the founder of Do Good By Us, but prior to that, a company called Gimme 20. Anybody ever heard of Gimme 20? Ah, see, therein lies the problem. So we're going to talk about that today. Um, I will pause at certain points for social media breaks since uh, this is not the first presentation I've given and I notice that a lot of heads go down throughout the presentation, so uh, we'll stop for that. Um, other than that, I'll try to uh, keep the questions to the end, but if you have something that's just absolutely burning, please put your hand up and, and hopefully uh, I'll be able to answer it and some other folks may have the same question as well. So everyone ready to go? <coughs> Good. So far, so good. All right. Well, this is me. You see my family. You see my wife. You see my son. My son's going to play a very, very big part in what's to come. So I mentioned that I'm the founder also of Gimme 20, which we'll get into. Uh, Six Degrees of Zach Rosenberg. Any of you looking for a great way to network? Uh, Six Degrees of ZR was a way it was a monthly newsletter that I put together while I was working for both BuzzFeed and Smart Brief as a way to find people who were unemployed jobs. I had a network of more than 6,000 people. Every month I would feature up to four people who were unemployed. Each month I would also uh, interview an entrepreneur, somebody whose ear I wanted to get a hold of, send it out, and more networks probably came through me than the folks in the newsletter. But if you're looking for a really great idea to get your name out there, I would certainly highly recommend it. I'm also, as I said, a veteran of BuzzFeed, Smart Brief, WebMD, and others. Sold advertising for eight years prior to jumping into social uh, entrepreneurship with both feet. I know what you're all thinking. He's so young. How can he have a kid that old? Thank you. So Do Good By Us is the marketplace for goods that do good. Our mission is to bring amazing projects to life through great products. Have any of you, all of you, had an opportunity to check us out? Hands up. Not enough. You're going to be cookied and followed throughout the internet anyway, so why not start with us? Come on. You probably can't see from the description for you in the back, but more than 50% of every sale goes back to a great cause. As an example of some of our campaigns, so I was mentioning to folks earlier, um, we ran a campaign in September where we were trying to raise enough money to buy medication for 500 people in Tanzania who had malaria. We created a bracelet that seems to have fallen off, and that's not a good sign, uh, a bracelet uh, to be sold, um, where every, every bracelet sold would supply us with one uh, dosage of medication. Goal was 500. We sold over 1,200 to date. Uh, meaning that 1,200 people are now going to get a second chance of life due to the purchases that were made through our site. So we are now starting to launch campaigns uh, with uh, American Diabetes Association, uh, Alzheimer's Association, Leukemia Lymphoma Society, and many other top 25 nonprofits throughout the country. So that's a little about our social venture, but obviously, as I said, we'll get a lot deeper into that. So Megan had asked me to come speak to you guys today after I wrote this article about making small changes every day for N10. Um, for those of you uh, who are going into the technology side of nonprofits, well, N10 has to be one of the first places that you start. Uh, terrific organization uh, run by a woman named Amy Sample Ward, uh, who is brilliant and uh, really does a very good job on a local basis of getting technology people together, but also nationally um, as a thought leader for nonprofits and technology. So, as I mentioned, this article was about making small changes every day. And that leads us to this. Now, I just came back on Saturday, so I'm either really awake or not, but from a trip to Rome. And I was reminded, as I had this presentation, that Rome wasn't built in a day, right? We've all heard that saying, and I literally saw it in action. 
But what's really interesting about that is that it's still under construction, right? Nothing is perfect. And I think that's the biggest hesitation of entrepreneurs, certainly many of the folks that I've met. I remember I once gave a speech, um, and afterwards a guy came up to me and told me you know, how excited he was. He's been working on this startup for a very long time, and he was just about ready to launch. So wondering what a long time meant to him, I asked, how long have you been working on this venture? And he told me he has had it basically in a vacuum for two years. Now my company is two years old and we have learned a lot by putting ourselves out there. We have customers, we have revenue, we have traction, we have press, and this guy has been working essentially in his basement on the idea for two years in a vacuum. Well of course things are going to be perfect in a vacuum, right? Perfect banana, right? I'm sure all of us have gone to the supermarket at some time in the last year or so. Has anyone ever seen a perfect banana? Whenever I walk in there, I see people weighing them. They're looking at the colors. They're smelling them. I, whatever else that they're trying to do to decipher what is the perfect banana. But I promise you, nothing in nature is perfect, and neither will your startup. Right? That's the idea behind making small changes every day. So jumping backwards for a second, one of these two is Amazon today, and one of them is Amazon from about 10 years ago. You're right, uh, from looking at it from your right, how many people think that's Amazon from today? Okay, most of you got it right. But they look pretty much identical, don't they? <laughs> Certainly not the big sweeping changes in the overhauls that you've seen on Yahoo or AOL or a hundred other sites. These are folks who have more data, more customers, more knowledge, more access to IT than just about anyone on the planet. Yet they are making small changes every single day. Right? If I were to tell you that this is Craigslist from 2006, you would have guessed that, right? Looks identical. Absolutely identical. The only notice, the only change that I saw were a couple new categories and the sidebar where it says the different cities, now you're prompted once you visit the site. So again, we're talking about one of the top 10 websites in the world making small changes every day. So hopefully at this point I can stop and you're like, yeah, I get it. We're gonna make small changes every day. So two heads, not. That's good. So that brings me to Gimme20. As I mentioned at the very beginning, I have started two, uh, two companies, Gimme20 being the first. Um, it was a bootstrap business, just as Do Good By Us is, and I can certainly get into why that is, as some folks had asked that earlier. Um, I'll start off simply by saying, not by choice, but that's okay. We're going to do it anyway. So Gimme20, uh, back in 2006, was one of the largest health and fitness social networks on the web. And essentially, Facebook was still pretty much on this campus, if not just a few other campuses. Um, our technology, our infrastructure, was supporting more than 25,000 people every month um, for a niche social network. Uh, that was certainly, amongst our competitors, uh, <coughs> who were very well funded, highly competitive. I had, um, as my kind of CFO or uh, COO, co-founder, we didn't really use titles, so make one up, uh, the former CFO of the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, we had two full-time developers. Again, this was all bootstrapped. We allowed what really made us unique, certainly at the time, is that you could build a workout and it, it had a video uh, component to it. So if you wanted to put together kind of your own set of exercises, there would be a video that would show you how to do each individual exercise. Um, I've never seen anything like that since. I'm sure that they exist, but certainly at the time that was pretty innovative. <coughs> there was no social features in terms of sharing and tweets and things like that. 
so that uh, always makes me laugh when I look back at the old site. But as I mentioned, we had about 25,000 users, and many of the power users, which made up about 5% of the site, were demanding changes. Right? They, they wanted to see all these new features. They wanted to be able to interact more. Uh, they wanted to uh, find workouts. They wanted to be able to share workouts. They wanted personal trainers to develop workouts for them, nutritionists. There was a laundry list of things that our most active users were asking from us. And of course, being a bootstrap small business, we heard these cries and we said, yes, we need to deliver on this. Right? I think everybody sees where this is going, but we're not getting there yet. So at launch, we were called the MySpace of health and fitness sites. How cool was that back in 2006, right? I actually, when I was looking back at this article, again, was so disappointed that there were no Facebook shares, tweets, <laughs> LinkedIn shares, and then, of course, realizing that this article was in 2006, and those features and functions didn't exist yet. So my pride went up just a little bit. Hey, look, Mom. I even got to do TV. That was pretty cool. I was flown up to Vancouver to do a show for G4 Television. Um, you know, that, that was certainly different. I think I was 25 years old at the time. There I look young. I think I look young now. So we started to, to survey users. We started to ask what kind of changes they wanted. We put out surveys. We hired branding experts. We hired design experts. We hired a UX expert. We poured a lot of the money that we had been making into some of these design elements. We spent more than six months poring over the data, asking friends and family, putting surveys out there. Again, we had these experts on hand who were telling us the best, brightest, smartest way to go about some of these changes for the site. Ways that would help us grow from the first 25,000 users to the next 25,000 users. What you're looking at here is just a small snippet of some of the SEO work we were doing to try to determine how we wanted to directionally take the site. Um, there was probably about 5,000 rows of data. I just wanted to make it look just so ominous you would understand what I was going through. When I say he was the CFO of the New York Stock Exchange, you can imagine how minute on data he would get. Brutal. Absolutely brutal. We did our competitive analysis. That was Nike's site back in 2006. I, I hope it looks a little bit different now. Uh, you can only imagine that it does. Some of our competitors, of course you've all used FitDay and FitTribe. Nobody knows what I'm talking about. Right? So all of us fared the same, the same destiny, ultimately. Much improved, right? Nobody? Somebody? Much improved. Right? Six months, lots of money, lots of experts. And this is the results we got. A site that would allow people, of course, with the same original features and functionality, to build their own workouts, learn, via video, how to perform some of the actions, interactive polls, more community, more sharing, more collaboration, the ability to upload your own videos, your own exercises, and make some money off of it, the ability to chat with nutritionists once a week, a trainer once a week, these were all paid services uh, that came through our platform. And we were, we were really thrilled. So the launch came, we got Horizon Fitness, and eBay as our launch sponsors, we were ready to rock and roll. Everybody sensing what's coming next? So our traffic, anybody see what that says? <laughs> what, what do you think the answer to that question was? You think we deliberately tried to, to slow down our traffic? No. No, we didn't. If, if anything, we were trying to double our traffic, right? That was, that was the idea. So what happened? How did we go from 25,000 to less than 5,000 in just a matter of weeks? 
we didn't take the advice that I'm now giving you into account. We didn't make the small changes every day. We were a social network. Social networks, as you guys know from your own experience, you use on a very regular basis. You visit them once a month, once a week, probably once a day. And certainly that's how people were using us back in 2006. People were coming to us on average about once every two weeks. Um, we even had a feature that would remind you via your friends to keep your goals going that they would get you to come back to the site. So we had a little mechanism to make sure that people were doing that. But remember what I said earlier. The people who were kicking our door down were the power users of our site, who made up maybe about 5% of our total audience. And those were the folks who would email us, call us, send us messages, and tell us all the features that they wanted to see in the next iteration of Gimme 20. Go back to it real quick so you can visualize it. You know, the content categories, the, the, the social networking features. But what we neglected was the 95%, right? The vast, the, the absolute vast majority of people who came to our site. Well, that was a tremendous mistake in hindsight, isn't it? Had we made small changes like Amazon, had we made small changes like Craigslist, this is probably still what I would be doing today. But because we made a big sweeping change, forced it upon our users, many of which you didn't see it coming or weren't looking for it, it ultimately spelled our demise. So as I mentioned, we went from 25,000 users down to 4,000 users. While we tried to revert back to the old site, the people who had visited once a month, again, they, they didn't know what they were looking at. The people who visited less than that really didn't know what they were looking at. Where were their features? Where were their functions? Look at it from Facebook's point of view. When Facebook changes where one button's placed, don't all of us go nuts? It's like the, left, the like button was on the left side today. Why is it on the right button? You know, what's going on here? So that one small change can send us all crazy, yet we did a complete overhaul of our website, right? On that sink in. Now, there are maybe some variations or, or things to this rule that, uh, that may be a little different. As I mentioned, we were a social networking site, a site that people came to on a more regular basis, had certain things in certain places that they were always looking for, and wanted to know that they'd be there the next time they returned, which of course was not the case. With an e-commerce site, it's a little bit different. First off, it's very seasonal. Obviously health and fitness is seasonal too, where January is, is the biggest time of year. But with an e-commerce site as I now run, we can make slightly bigger changes than we could with a social network. Not that we do, obviously, having learned that lesson, but there are times, there are places where you can make bigger changes. I wouldn't recommend it, but you could. As I showed, even Amazon, the biggest e-commerce site on, on the web, is still only making these small changes. Now, I talked about that 5% your power users, your people who are going to have your ear, your access, the ones who are going to respond to the surveys, the ones who are going to want um, the giveaways, the ones who are going to want to uh, get the discounts, the ones who are going to stick with you through thick and thin. Right? Our power users would have stayed with us had we not changed a single thing. They were our power users. They were the ones who were the biggest advocates. But when everyone else started to leave and the site felt more like a ghost town, well, what were they to do, right? Yes, they were producing the bulk of the content, but they weren't the consumers of most of the content, right? It was that interaction that kept them producing at the rates and the levels that they were producing at. Which brings me to this slide. The problem with advice is that it's free, right? And it's going to come from absolutely everywhere. 
even unsolicited, mostly unsolicited, right? From people who are experts and people who are not, right? The changes that you're being asked to make are not necessarily coming from maybe the most qualified people. So as you sit around your dinner table or with your friends, your family, you're going to start to hear things. Now, how do you moderate, right? As I used the example earlier with Craigslist, there's a very um, thorough process that they use before they make a change. They have to get 100,000 people asking for the same thing, literally asking, whether it's a petition, emails, whoever's tracking it, I certainly am glad it's not me, has to get about 100,000 notifications before they even consider making that change. Right? So they're, they're waiting till basically the vast majority have decided that they want to see a difference. And you should too. So be wary of your friends, family, not in the sense that they're not trying to help you, they certainly are. But you have to be the curator of what's best for you and your business. Could you help just scale that a little bit for most of us in the room who are probably aren't looking at 100,000 users? Well, I, I mean, scale it to exactly what you do have. I mean, if you see, you know, this is, this is kind of the lean startup mentality, right? Um, the minimum viable product. Put it out there, and if you see that 30% of your usership is demanding something, then you should absolutely make that change. We made the change based on 5%, and we made a sweeping overhaul, right? We're not talking about one feature. If, if people wanted the like button on the right, versus the left, that, that's one thing. Um, they didn't go from red to blue, blue to red, right? So uh, I would say that you have to probably play in that 30% range, but again, talking about one feature, not some sweeping overhaul. Any other questions? Okay. Well, we'll leave a social media break here, as I promised. I certainly highly recommend the top tweet. I think that uh, that'd be much appreciated. So I'll just ask one more time before we move on to the next section, which is currently where I am uh, with Do Good By Us. If there's any other questions about Gimme 20 and kind of the operation there and kind of the faults that we made. Yes? Did you try going back? Um, Go, do we try going back to relaunch the business? Do we try going back to... To what the site was before and what people were comfortable with? Um, we, we really couldn't at that point. It wasn't a matter of... I mean, our, our sale, our sponsorship to eBay, uh, to Horizon Fitness, and to some of the other investors we were trying to pitch was against the, the products and features that we could offer on the new site. Um, we, we tried to go back to all the people, you know, that we had email addresses for and asking them to give us another shot or, um, you know, tried to go out there in as many ways as possible. We didn't really have the way to, to notify people such as social media that we would have had today. Um, do I think that that would have helped? I don't know. It's hard to say. Um, but what probably would have happened was we would have gotten even more feedback so much quicker Right, that we would have just maybe even made the changes in less than six months. Um, certainly more than, you know, it was very deliberate, the changes we made. So, yes? I don't want, um, I'm not trying to nitpick, and it might just be semantics, and that's fine, but if there's a distinct difference, I'm trying to discover that. So, I'm trying to figure out the conflict between making a small change every day and waiting for 30% of your user base to suggest a specific change. You're right, they're two different things. The, the, the ultimate point is that make the small change every day and you won't have to worry about getting that 30% threshold, right? I mean, if you put something out there, make a very small change and people, you know, again, it's depending on how many users you have, you might have to wait a week, you might have to wait a month. That doesn't mean that you can't make several small changes over that time, but to get the results that you need might take a little bit longer. That being said, um, there's a tool that we use called Optimizely. I don't know if anyone's familiar with it. It's a uh, multivariate testing tool. Uh, it allows you to do between one and five variations. So you don't even have to make, essentially, a full-fledged small change. 
Um, we can test the color of a single button on a page up to five different colors and just let that run. And it takes about 100, 100, um, 100 people per variation for it to come back and say, this is the one you should go with. So to, to that point, don't wait for the 30%. Right? You know when things are wrong. You know where people are dropping off. And analytics and data are going to tell you that. Okay. Feel good about that answer? That helps, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. I think I saw one more hand over here. Yes? You mentioned there were a number of competitors in your field that all more or less failed, I'm going to guess, more or less at the same time. And I'm curious um, what problems they faced and why you think that this specific thing you're describing is actually the problem if everybody failed. They failed much later on than we did. And I think a lot of it had to do with, um, it's a great question. The Nikes of the world far exceeded that anything that we could have done technologically, certainly at the time. I mean, you saw the Map My Run feature that Nike was coming out with, the devices. Obviously, none of us could have competed with that. But the Fit Day and Fit Tribes in the crowd lasted several years longer than we did. Their traffic continued to rise, right? And it might have had a direct result because our changes force those people to go in other directions. That we'll never know. Um, I don't know that they necessarily failed without an exit. Um, I can't tell you that I kept up with them much once we kind of went out because, you know, the competitive edge was obviously gone. But uh, they did not make those big sweeping changes that we did. Th that much I can tell you. Ready to move on? All right. So there's my son. There's the supermarket. And this essentially was the launch of Do Good By Us. We were walking through the cereal aisle. And as you can see, he was about three and a half, four years old at the time. And look at what he's staring at, right? Tricks, Cocoa Pebbles, so on and so forth. I read the labels on the side of the box, and I was pretty horrified at what I was looking at. In some of the boxes, I saw over 90 ingredients, but only four I'd ever heard of. Right? And those four ingredients were like sugar, more sugar, high fructose corn syrup, and the toy. Sometimes the toy was actually the healthiest thing in the box. Right? So as we're walking up and down this aisle, you can see he's pretty upset at the moment because I told him he couldn't have the cereals that he's looking at. Um, we picked up a box of Paul Newman's own cereal. And we've bought some of the other products. We've, uh, you know, we've certainly bought the cereal before, but now we have an eye towards the boxes that are in front of us, what else is in them. And I see the moniker on the top of the box, and it says that all profits go to charity. So I thought, that's great. I, I'm on board with that. I looked at the ingredients on the side of the box, and there was four ingredients in there, all of them natural and organic. So I thought, wow. There must be a million organizations out there that were not only good for you, but doing good for others. And so I tried to find them. And that's, that was how Do Good By Us started, right? There was a need that I felt. Uh, there was a need that um, when I went home and I was searching on the web, when I was asking friends and family, you know, could you find more products like this? Everyone knew of one or two, right? But everyone knew a different one or two. So I thought, wow, there must be a million people out there with the same problem, right? How do I find, again, products that were good for you and good for others? So on August 1st of 2011, I started Do Good By Us. And at the time, we were just trying to figure things out, right? I'm almost embarrassed to show what the first site looked like, but that's not the point, right? We talked about the minimum viable product. We talked about the lean startup. So, so many nonprofits were asking, or social ventures, and we can get into that, what is this going to look like? How is it going to work? What's it going to feel like? So, we put up a test page, right? We started gathering data. But one of the things that we realized, and certainly we'll, we'll dive into this, is that we launched with a Father's Day package. It was highly priced, $75. The products were pretty dreadful, and we didn't really sell very many. 
Um, I don't think anyone could have really sold very many. The products were terrible. Not the point. The point is, is that we put it out there and we learned that the hard way, right? The data told us that this product was not something that the market wanted. It was not even something that our friends and family wanted, right? How are we going to sell it to anybody else? And I guess ultimately, you know your mistake is uh, a big one, or the learning lesson is a big one, when Forbes writes about it. Kind of funny, right? Well, if you're going to fail, fail big, or something along those lines. So, you know, we, we knew what we were doing was, was not the answer, or at least that particular product was not the answer. Maybe our philosophy was not the answer. What was it, right? What were the small changes that we were going to make to figure it out? Well, over time, certainly the site evolved um, from many different background colors to many different products to many different business models. As I said, we've been bootstrapped for over two years, so we've had the flexibility to really figure it out, and we've had to. Uh, we now have a full-time staff of four. We have three interns, which at our size absolutely counts, so don't take that away from us. And in order to feed all these people, we've, we've had to figure it out. And I think that's, uh, that's been tremendous for us. And it started here. Right? So the first philosophy that we had, that we applied to do good by us, is called cry and buy. We were going to tell you such a sad sob story that you would have bought anything to ease the pain of these people, these, these puppies, whoever. Right? You were going to cry and you were going to buy. The emphasis was on the cause, not on the product, right? We saw that earlier, that we were selling a $75 golf bag that, I mean, no golfer would have wanted. That is very clear. And the story, while good, was not enough to push the product, even to our friends and family. So cry and buy didn't work. And that took time beyond just the Forbes article and our first set of products to realize. Right? We had added probably 25 more partners um, and maybe about 70 or so products, about three products per, per organization, to really come to that conclusion that cry and buy was not going to work. Right? We did it in our content. We did it on the copy on the site. I think you can even sort of see the, the beginning there. Um, yes, Father's Day, but the gifts that keep on giving. Right? It was all about the story, particularly when you got to the page, more so than maybe the, the headlines. And then we went the other way, right? Well, people don't care about the cause or the story, so let's just hit them with the product, right? 100% product, 98% product, and 2% was going to be an oh, by the way, right? It was all about the cause. Here's a great example. We have a partner called Soapbox Soaps, one of the most fantastic soaps that you've ever used, I promise you that. And Soapbox Soaps has an ingredient that Dove Soap doesn't, and it's the most important ingredient that actually defines it as soap. It's called glycerin. Anybody who saw the movie Fight Club is familiar with the term glycerin, right? Dove Soap strips out all, or basically all of the glycerin in a bar of soap. The, the product that actually cleans you. Because what they've discovered is that on the commodities market, you can sell that glycerin for way more than you can get for a bar of soap. So when you're using Dove, you're actually just using a deodorant of sorts. You're not using much of a cleaning product at all. And in fact, if you watch their commercials right now, maybe they heard me giving this lecture before, if you see their commercials, they say, we're not soap. We're different than soap. We act with your body differently. Well, I've been trying to say that for almost two years, right? So we were out there telling the story of soapbox soaps, the fact that it had a high concentration of glycerin, the fact that you were actually going to get clean. Um, we, we've heard some amazing success stories of rashes going away and things like that from people who had been using other types of soap forever. And that didn't really work either, right? Focusing solely on the product. And after testing, after putting these products out there, again, maybe another 30 partners. We were probably up to about 75 or so once we stopped uh, using this philosophy of product first. 
it was basically coming down to now price, right? Why people couldn't justify paying maybe two times, three times the price for, in this particular example, a bar of soap without that cause element, without understanding how their purchase was maybe making an impact, right? What we've found, again, through the small changes every day, is that people are willing to pay up to 20% more for a product they perceive that gives back. Interestingly enough, Nielsen did a very similar survey in January, in June of 2012, where they found that 48% of Americans are actually willing to pay between 20 and 30% more for a product that gives back. Now, our small changes every day tell us that it's 20%, but if you can go up to 30%, by all means, go up to 30%. But that didn't work for us. So it, I'm sure all of you are familiar with Thrillist. And as I mentioned, um, I, prior to starting Do Good By Us, tried to interview a different entrepreneur every month. Ben Lehrer, the founder of Thrillist, uh, is one of them. Ben's father, Ken, was one of the founders of Huffington Post. And together, the two of them run Lehrer Ventures, a uh, venture capital firm. So I had a chance to sit down with Ben and ask him some questions, one of which being for, for the men in the room or maybe even some of the women who read Thrillist, they have a very distinct voice, right? It's like they're talking to me as one of my friends. And I was curious how they came to that because that is not an easy thing to do. And what Ben said to me is that essentially, of course, at the beginning, they went 10 degrees in one direction. They completely spoke over people's heads. And then after a lot of testing and a lot of time, they swung the pendulum 15 degrees in the opposite direction. And again, they completely missed their audience. So it took time, iteration, small changes for them to get the voice that has made them as successful as they are. And so we applied that to story selling. Not storytelling, but we're trying to move products. So story selling was our way to accomplish the same thing. Again, we had swung the pendulum in one direction and completely missed with cry and buy. Swung the pendulum in the other direction, tried to push products, completely missed the mark as well. But story selling has really found a home for us. This was how we were able to find our voice. And again, it was those small changes over months and months and months that allowed us to get here. So what is story selling? Well, story selling is the most important phrase of story selling is because of you. And as social entrepreneurs, nonprofits, people, you know, as you guys go into this space, use this phrase as best you can. This is a weapon in our arsenal that other ventures, uh, for profit particularly, can't use. Or if they do, it'd be very difficult. Because of you, as I said earlier, um, with our bracelet campaign, we were able to say that because of you and your purchase, we were able to send more than 1,200 uh, doses of medication to this group in Tanzania. Because of you, we were able to, uh, an earlier campaign that we did in the summer, um, send 12 women back to college on scholarship through the sale of these products, right? Because of you. That was what we determined as the most important thing for our business. That was the voice that we had been missing the entire time, right? People needed to know that the products were making these great projects happen. And that was completely being lost in cry and buy, right? When we were telling this sob story, we were telling them that there was no way to almost help these people, right? That this is what they were facing each and every day. And you could buy the product and that one purchase might make a difference in somebody's life, but ultimately, you're not really going to make an impact. On the other side, we were pushing product and completely neglected all the good work that we were trying to do. We were do good by us, right? And that, that was gone. So story selling and our campaigns, as I mentioned, allow us to say, because of you, these projects are now possible, right? Your purchase of a water bottle will matter, will make a difference. And that was much stronger 
than anything we had used before. And as I said, has been extremely successful for us once we really started to figure out the formula. So again, because of you. This is something that you know, your Dove soaps can't use. Right? Your competitors in, in the solely for-profit space would really be hard-pressed to use this against you in some way, shape, or form. Yes. What's the reason why the competitors cannot use it? Can well, it's hard for the it's hard for Dove Soap to say because of your purchase we're going to make a difference in this tribe or village, or because of your purchase, you know, X amount of people are going to eat tonight, something along those lines, right? They have CSR campaigns, but they're just simply one-offs, or um, you know, it, it's it's not about they're never going to really push the impact of the product, right? They're going to push the product. They want you to buy more product. They're going to focus solely on the benefits of the product. They're not going to use their time to talk about some of their other cause-related items or campaigns. I've not seen it. That brings us to the boardroom, right? So as I mentioned, this is the second bootstrapped company that I've started. Um, not necessarily by choice, but more than two years in, four employees, three interns. Uh, we're going to keep going until eventually that day comes. But when you're in those rooms, they're going to ask you about your impact, right? Particularly if you're the for-profit side, obviously. When you're going out there and looking for investors, some of them will see the investment or some of them will see your business as just a marketing tactic. Some of them are going to ask you to really push that to the side. Um, you're going to see a whole lot of different things over time. There are groups, as I mentioned uh, to some of the folks earlier, called, uh, like Investor Circle, which are angel investors that look specifically for social ventures. There's the Social Venture Network, which is kind of a sister organization. They, too, uh, have a group of angel investors who are looking to um, invest in social ventures. Uh, we've been selected to pitch in front of two of their conferences. so. Our time hasn't come yet in terms of investment. But it's, it's really interesting, depending on the type of investor you get in front of, what they're looking for, as I mentioned. Some of them are, you know, all of them are looking for the return on investment. But some are more open to the impact side than others. Um, we found that we had a lot more luck and a lot more traction going through the technology investors than we did with the social impact investors. Um, what I've found based on the conferences that I attended and the people I've talked to is that if you're doing something environmental, uh, perhaps in education, um, you're probably, or uh, uh, agriculture, you're probably better off going with a strictly social investor. Um, if you're looking for a technology or you have a technology, go for the technology investors. The social impact investors are not necessarily as savvy in that space as others. So for those of you who are going out there thinking, yes? I was just going to ask, are, um, are you all planning on uh, taking funding at any point, or are you going to grow organically? We can only make as big of an impact as the amount of money that we bring in, right? We have to sell the products in order to make the impact. So yes, we would like to take money. I'm glad that we didn't take it earlier. If we want to start to hit certain levels and higher, we're going to have to do that. Actually, we had talked about this earlier. The reason that we chose to become for profit was exactly that, right? We felt that if we were a service for nonprofits and we were also a nonprofit, we were competing for a lot of the same um, dollars in terms of donations that they were. The other huge advantage is that we can give equity. We can also trade equity, obviously, um, for dollars, things that our nonprofits obviously cannot do. So yes, we would like to get investment. We've been to a number of meetings. I was talking about a story earlier where uh, we talked to an investor on a Thursday, offered a $250,000 investment after conversation on the phone. He said, bring your term sheet on Tuesday when we meet in person, which we did. And then uh, when we sat down, it's like the guy had never heard of us before. Right? So you're going to see all different types out there, that is for sure. But I think that we were, and certainly um, you know, making the point again of small changes every day, 
we had to be certainly fiercer and we had to be smarter because we didn't get the investment that we were hoping for or thinking we were going to get by this point, right? We had to figure out story selling because we had no other choice. We had to figure out what's coming next, again, because we had no other choice. So when you know, this kind of reaches that level where I'm able to invest, something that would be very important for me is folks who've been bootstrapping for at least a year. Because I know from my own personal experience that f everything up until at least the year mark is testing and iterating, right? The small changes. Once you hit that point, then you really figured it out. You had to. Certainly full time as a, um, a year full time. So, any other questions before I? Okay. So I guess we go back and forth, but so our conversations in the boardroom asked a lot of really good questions, right? Finance guys, as I'm sure you all know, are very smart and they do know how to make a lot of money. And they asked us questions that we didn't necessarily know how to answer, right? How are we going to balance making money with making an impact? As I said, we can't make an impact if we don't make money, right? So we're no good to anyone if we don't bring in dollars. But how are we going to please folks like this? Now, obviously, as I said, we haven't. And that could be for 100 reasons. Who knows? But based on all the things that we did here, we developed our crowd commerce campaigns. So crowd commerce, as a component of story selling, is the goal we're trying to achieve. That's the difference, right? As I mentioned, we were putting products up on the site, and you would buy one, but not necessarily make an impact. Now we're saying that by buying 300 of these water bottles, we're able to build a water well in Nepal. Because of you and your purchase of this water bottle, we are getting closer to building that well in Nepal. Right? That was the story selling component. And that, again, took time, iteration, more than two years for us to start to develop these campaigns. But as I mentioned, now we're working with some of the largest nonprofit organizations in the country on very similar projects. So for us, crowd commerce was the answer of how are we going to scale? How are we going to raise more money, right? One of the big differences for us as well, and this isn't always the case, is that we now do some product development. So not only are we just featuring the products, but we're actually making them as well. Uh, there seems to be two clear distinctions between the types of products that we get on our site. There are nonprofit organizations or social ventures that are focused on sustainability. And for them, they often develop products that they use to sell. For the other half, more of the advocacy groups, if you will, they don't really want to play in the product space. Um, they don't have any expertise in it. It's not really their interest. So for us to develop products uh, was very important in our ability to work with them. Right? That was another question that came up often from the investors was, how are you going to scale if the nonprofits are the ones making the products? Right? If you got 10,000 orders, how would they fulfill them? It's a great question, right? So that experience in the boardroom helped us understand that we had to have a solution for scaling to 10,000 products, um, which, which now we understand that we're, we've sold, you know, in some cases, 5,000 to 10,000 products uh, of a single, single item, uh, how that works and how that wouldn't have worked if we had relied on some of our nonprofit partners to figure that out. So crowd commerce was a direct result of those small changes every day, right? Tried the cry and buy, tried the product focus. Story selling was the first component, right? We figured out how to tell our story. We figured out how to get people interested and excited, um, sharing the content, and really feeling a sense of ownership over the campaigns and the projects that we were trying to fulfill. Second element to it was crowd commerce. Crowd commerce allowed us to make these tangible goals and give a story to tell. Right? When we were able to reach our goal, uh, sending 12 women back to school on scholarship, that was a story that we were able to follow up on a month later and share with the users who made the purchase that because of you, these women were going back to school. Right? Hope you're enjoying the product and keep your eyes open for the next campaign and another way to help. Sinking in? Sure. Can you provide more clarification about that question that you were asked by in the 
in the boardroom about how are you going to scale? Yeah, so originally we sold only the products made by nonprofits or social ventures. And what the investor asked was, well, if, some, if you sell 10,000 of these bracelets or this product, what was your nonprofit going to do? Right? They didn't necessarily have the manpower to fulfill such a tremendous order. Right? Nor was it really in, in their best interest to do that. Right? They were trying to save the world. They were trying to make the world a better place. Were they going to sit there and knit you know, 10,000 shirts? Probably not. That was not a good use of, of their time. So could we find sources to develop 10,000 shirts? Yeah, we can find folks who have them readily available and good quality made in the United States. So for them, that made them feel a lot better about our ability to scale, right? Because now making 10,000 is something that can be done in a week as opposed to maybe four months, right? They would have to have hired skilled labor. They would have had to have trained them. So send them over. Um, now that was no longer an issue, I think. On um, your example, uh, you have a partner in Nepal who's doing the implementation. Yes. That can be a social enterprise, NGO, or profit, whatever. My question is, do you have uh, any criteria of who uh, will you support? Criteria for the institution? Well, they're our nonprofit partner. They're called Dopper. Right, so they're the feet, they're the boots on the ground that are bringing this project to life. Yeah. Um, do you have number of years that they should be operating or size of assets as your criteria and how, how do you partner with them? Charity Navigator is obviously a great place to start. Um, for a time, and again this is more in our cry and buy, we provided the financials of every one of the nonprofits we were working with. Those pages were never downloaded, based on the statistics we saw. Um, the pictures and the stories do the best job we can do of conveying that these projects are ap actually happening. Was that the question about will these things actually occur? Um, sorry. My question is, for example, I have a nonprofit in the Philippines or in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. how, how, how can I partner with, the, uh, with your initiative? The criteria for which we'll work with a partner. Is that essentially the question? So that, that took a long time for us to get to as well, and of course testing and iterating. But ultimately what we came up with is that every transaction has to give back. So that could be a for-profit partner, that could be a non-profit partner, but that was criteria number one. Um, number two, being a registered 5013C, if they were a non-profit, was important. But Really, ultimately, number three was having a product that we could sell. Um, now that we're doing product development, things have certainly changed, but the, also the organizations that we work with have changed, right? As I said, we are now really focused on some of the largest organizations in the country so we can show the impact that we're making. And there's not necessarily a question of some of the projects or the organizations we're working with, right? They bring the brand equity, which is for all of you who are starting social ventures or nonprofits, the fastest way to grow an audience is through someone else's audience, right? And that's something you'll certainly learn uh, the hard way, right? When we partner with a Leukemia Lymphoma Society, when we partner with an Alzheimer's Association, these are well-established folks who have, been in, who have tremendous audiences that can be delivered to us through partnership, right? For us to go out and acquire or market our way to a similar size audience, we just wouldn't have the resources to do even if we were extremely well funded. Um, so long answer to your question, but hopefully I got there. Yes? When you work with someone like Soapbox Soaps that already has a social component to their uh, product, do you also donate proceed that sale, or is it the Soapbox? That's the, correct. So did everyone hear the question? OK, so uh, our partner Soapbox Soap is a social venture. right? With every bar of soap that's purchased, they give a bar of soap away. Um, it's the buy one, give one model. And the question was, do we then give another percentage back? And the answer is no. Our contribution is through the buy one, give one, um, not necessarily an additional contribution from our side. Does that answer? Great, great. Yeah. Um, I have a question about the, your goals that you set. 
Um, so I'm really curious about when you set like let's say 300 water bottles, do you want to set something that like you know is going to fill by a certain point? Because like the difference between like 300 and say 10,000, and the like, people seeing like maybe it's not going to my goal, mm -hmm. or they will pass it really quickly. And I was just curious from kind of. The, the campaign hasn't even really started yet. That's why you're not seeing much there. Yeah. Um, the goal that you want to set is obviously beyond achievable, right? Even if you fall completely short, you want to make sure that you exceed it, right? Because you want to give, you, you want to set the bar. Uh, as I said, I sold advertising for eight years prior to starting, so it's always chasing rainbows, right? Um, that's that's the terminology we certainly use in advertising, where um, you know it's always just a little bit further. It's a little bit further than can be achieved, and that's exactly where you want to set the limits, right? Because you want to push, you want to get people group buying, right? You want them to see that we're 50 water bottles away and they have five friends who want one, right? So get them on board. Um, but you don't want to set the bar obviously beyond what's possible because then you won't achieve it and you don't have the good story to sell afterwards. Um, so certainly make it achievable. Uh, but really the goal, at least in this case, was tied to the building of that uh, water well, right? So. It, it translates obviously into a certain number of dollars. We use the products, not dollars, because again, we want to make the association in people's mind that it's because of the product that these projects are happening, not because of the dollars. We, we sell more than 2,000 products um, in two years, so we really had a chance to look at the data and, and see what works. Jewelry and accessories are runaway successes against everything else, that's for sure. Um, and as I was saying earlier, sometimes it, it's not just about the product. Everybody at some point has had a Lance Armstrong bracelet. Um, I don't think that those are necessarily desirable products, but they sell $35 million worth every year. So, you know, there's certainly something to the story. Um, they were also a dollar for five, right? So it wasn't a tremendous giveaway. But um, jewelry and accessories are the products that work best. Do you not think that the challenge not being able to extrapolate whether it's the product or the well, that was that was exactly the, the pendulum, right, scenario where we were doing the cry and buy, trying to sell the story. Products weren't moving, trying to sell just the product, and then people were were looking at the product and saying, "This is great, but why am I paying so much more?" Um, because we lost the story part of it, right? So yes, they do work together. Let's say seventy-five, twenty-five. 75 being the product, 25 being the story, um, but it has to be a strong product. If this is the type of social venture that you plan to go into. So where can I begin? We talked to obviously a tremendous amount about um, where not to begin. So hopefully that came, that came across pretty clearly, right? Um, you know, it's, it's the big sweeping changes that, again, people are always looking for perfection, the, ripe, the perfect bananas, all these, whatever, you know, metaphor I plan to use in the next five minutes. But, you know, really, it's, it's all about cut, 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 right? Focus on three goals that you hope to achieve, right? Make them, make them possible to achieve. Uh, don't set the bar at, you know, get a million users by tomorrow, because that's definitely not going to happen. Setting yourself up for failure. But if you're focused on so many different things, it's going to really be hard to see what's working and what's not. Um, as I said, you could, depending on the size of um, your customer base, traffic to your website may take a little longer to get the results that you're looking for. But there's so much access to data now that you, know, you will be able to get to the answer or you will be able to get to the bottom of whatever it is that you're trying to learn or understand. So cut it down, keep it narrow. Test and iterate. It's boring. It's thankless in, in a lot of cases. Um, but you know, w without, have, without having devoted our time and ourselves to looking at all the different styles, all the different campaigns that we ran, um, each one will get a little bit better. right? And we'll make a small change, small adjustment. Uh, and many of them can be done in real time. I think that's another, we talked about social media earlier. Um, we're able to get feedback faster than we were able to get feedback at any other point, certainly in history, right? 
Um, so definitely test and iterate. Ask for help. You know, I talked about how advice is free. The friends and family, right? Well, there are experts out there, and they are willing to help you, certainly as you're starting out. Many people who charge you know, thousands of dollars of hours, uh, thousands of dollars an hour, um, will make themselves available to you uh, just by asking, right? I'm starting out. As I mentioned uh, with my Six Degrees newsletter, I was able to access people that I never thought I'd be in the same room with just by saying, hey, I'll put you up on my blog. My blog got like 100 people a month visiting, right? It was, it was not even worth paying the, the $5 a month for for, costing, uh, for hosting, but hey, I was ob able to open up doors and really get some great advice, like Ben Lehrer from Thrillist and others. So that's, that's part of it, right? That's, that's the first section, making small changes every day. But as I said, we've been bootstrapping for two years, right? At some point, I would have either said to myself, hey, this is going to work or it's not, right? But in my opinion, my quote in fancy handwriting, not my own handwriting, entrepreneurship only begins when everyone else would have quit, right? I'm sure you've all heard the saying that, you know, there's no such thing as a overnight, ex uh, sorry, takes 10 years for an overnight success and so on. If I asked you guys what your Pinterest started, I'm sure many of you would have said 2008, right? Probably not. I heard of Pinterest for the first time, I think everyone else did, in early two, two, uh, 2012. Had no idea it had been around for that long. I'm sure most people feel the same way. Um, you know, Twitter, same thing. Um, I don't know if anyone ever used Twitter back in like 2007, I think, late 2007. But there was no personal feed. So every time you'd update, it was, what, what are you doing right now, was the question at the top of the page. And so every time you refresh, there would be like thousands thousands of people who were posting what they were doing right then. Right? You couldn't follow it, not that you could follow anything today, but you certainly couldn't follow it back then. Right? So stick with it, perseverance. I think that is the winning combination between making small changes every day and being successful. And I, it would really be sad if I didn't read this, um, but this is from a uh, Matthew Kelly's The Rhythm of Life. I got this, I think, in college. I'm not even sure what really drew me to it, but there's kind of one passage that always uh, is top of mind. And I just want to give you guys a little glimpse and hopefully it inspires you to, to stick with what you're doing. <clears throat> Early on, um, this person uh, was forced out of their home and had to go to work to support themselves. Uh, they were about 13 years old at the time. Two years later, uh, his mom died. A few years later, he started a business which failed. A few years later, he ran for the House of Representatives and lost. One year later, he applied for law school and got rejected. One year later, he borrowed money from a friend. Business was bankrupt within a year. One year later, ran for state legislature and lost. One year later, got engaged, fiance died, and he was bedridden for six months in depression. Two years later, ran for state legislature again and lost. Two years after that, ran for controller and lost. Three years after that, ran for Congress and lost. One year later, ran for Congress and won. Uh, sorry, two years later, ran for Congress and won. Ran for re-election and lost. Ran again for controller a year later and lost. Five years later ran for senator and lost. Two years later ran for vice president of the United States, received less than 100 votes and lost. Two years after that ran for senate again and lost. And two years after that Abraham Lincoln was elected president. Talk about perseverance. Why on earth would this guy think that he could run for president? Right? Under what circumstances did he feel that he was the best guy for the job? Right? I don't think anyone will argue his place in history. They may talk about what happened to him about six years later, but that's okay. 
point is, is that he made a tremendous impact and he never gave up, right? And so that's the second component to being a successful entrepreneur, right? I'm sure several times along the way, people told him that you're nuts to continue doing this. But I think we're all better off for it that he has. So, what, yep, go ahead. You, did you have a question? Sure. Um, anything about Link? No. <laughs> okay. Sure. So the the question was about the do good by us revenue model. Um, bit of a downer. No, I'm just kidding. That's fine. <laughs> so the way that we make money, of course, is through percentage of sales. Uh, the percentage is higher when we make the product. Percentage is lower when we don't. Um, we also do straight product development, so folks who are looking to um, make their next version of the Lance Armstrong bracelet but don't necessarily want to sell through our platform can come to us. Um, and now we have a specialty, obviously, in nonprofits. But the vast majority of our revenue comes from percentage of sales or upsells to more exposure through the site. Okay. Good. All right, cool. All right, well, that essentially concludes my presentation. I hope you really got a lot out of it, of course. I hope that it helps inspire you, obviously, with the story of Lincoln and kind of our own failings and our perseverance, even though we haven't received the funding that we hoped we would, uh, certainly by this point. And hopefully it gives you a clear plan on how you can achieve entrepreneurial success yourself. So with that, I will open it up for questions. Yes? I have uh, two questions about the because of you and how you follow up. Uh, when you're doing the crowd commerce, mm -hmm. are you using social media to email people who have, say, you know, tell your friends? Absolutely. I mean, social is a huge component. Um, over a 30-day campaign, we create six pieces of content. Um, one in advance that tells people what's coming, one each week to notify people of how we're tracking to goal, and then it also kind of just shares some of the stories of what's happening on the ground, uh, and then one about a month or two after when the project is actually taken hold to follow up with those people who purchase and say, hey, look what you did. And so that leads right into the second question. Is, do you find that because of you sort of add follow up at the end is what helps you no question. And with every campaign we do, we're attracting a new audience from a different place. Um, when we do a campaign with the Children's Miracle Network or do a campaign with the Leukemia Lymphoma Society, there's certainly crossover between people who are interested in both. So yes, the more people who get into our network through one campaign, uh, we've been pretty successful in getting them to follow up on another campaign. Social media uh, if I could go on a bit of a rant, which I suppose I can because I'm standing up here. Um, social media is good for, for many things. Direct sales is not one of them. Um, you're not going to really be able to tweet someone to purchase something. You're not going to be able to Facebook post something to get someone to buy. That's why content is such a, a crucial part to social media. Um, IBM uh, ran a study over uh, the holiday season in 2012. IBM obviously has their analytics and data packages across you know, many of the top sites, top retailers across the world, and found that I think 0.01% of Twitter um, traffic converted into sales. That's statistically insignificant, right? Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, not much better. I think 0.03 or 0.04, but less than 1%. Um, email was amongst the best, and search was the top. Yes? I think with those stats, so it kind of highly depends on the type of business. Because, like, for example, for me, I do online courses and um, web development. And when I do email, like, I do, I do all the analytics to develop that. Email basically doesn't give me, um, like, nobody signs up. And then once I tweet about it, I'll get, like, an incentive, I'll get, like, maybe five or something. Does a sign up mean transaction? Yeah, basically, they, they buy it. 
kudos to you. I would I would say that. Uh, I find it's mainly just the social network, like just Twitter, or like me posting on a YouTube video or something like that. I remember sitting on a panel for Internet Week in New York, and uh, the other folks I was on, they were asked the question about how social media works for their business, and the three other people were like, "Great, amazing, ah." Oh, our social media following, tremendous. We can get them to do anything. And I went, I, we don't see it. And the people I talk to don't see it. And then each one of them went back and they're like, yeah, I mean, it, it's not exactly what we hoped for. It wasn't you know, the boon that we thought it would be and so on and so forth. So I think there's, I'm not discounting or discrediting what you're saying, but um, I don't think that it's been an overwhelming success for most people. Well, but the IBM. The Sure. And that's true, but the IBM data doesn't lie, right? They're going across 100,000 sites and seeing that kind of percentage. So, you, I mean, if it works for you, stick with it, test and iterate, right? Small changes. But uh, certainly for us, we haven't seen it directly sell. The content, the sharing of the content, the people reading the content, content finds the right audience, right? If you see a headline that says 11 great gifts that give back, and you click on it, you must be interested in 11 great gifts that give back, right? So as you're writing that kind of content, sharing it out, um, that's what's going to draw people in. So it's the, it's the content, not necessarily the direct tweets. Any other questions? I have one. Sure. Um, when you're developing a product, when you're choosing which product to develop, are you somebody coming in, a nonprofit coming in, and you find a product to match, or do you have a product you need to go find? The first, um, we're trying to attract their audience. And of course, they're going to know their audience better than we will. Uh, we have the experience on the product development side. We know what's possible and capable and what it could look like and feel like and what consumers ultimately may want. And that's our job to steer them. But what we've found is that a lot of them build around kind of tentpole events. So they have a 5K or they have their gala or they have some sort of fundraising event that they're trying to uh, support. Um, with uh, Habitat for Humanity, um, we're going to be launching a campaign after they do a fundraiser with Jimmy Carter. Right? So they wanted to tie the publicity that they're going to be uh, receiving from that. We haven't exactly uh, announced what the product's going to be, but it's going to tie in with that and, and move forward. So um, again, it's important to make sure that the product is great and that there's a great cause to support it. Any other questions? That good a presentation, huh? All right. Fantastic. Yes? What keeps you doing it? Whoa. I can't, I can't look my son in the eye and tell him that I gave up on, on his dream, you know? Um, what keeps me doing it, A, is, is it's working, right? We finally figured out the formula. Um, I certainly don't want to work for anyone else. That sounds terrible. <laughs> Just making sure everyone was on board with that. OK, good. Um, and I mean, look, get to do presentations like this. When I was working for BuzzFeed or, or SmartBrief or you know any of those other organizations, um, you wouldn't have the doors wouldn't open the way that they open once you become an entrepreneur. And the community and the people that you surround yourself or find yourself talking to, um, you will feel like you've met your match is kind of the wrong way to put it, but you will certainly feel more at home than you did when you were working for others. So if you have that entrepreneurial spirit and that drive, um, I like to think that it's hereditary. I found out that four generations of my family have been entrepreneurs. So I certainly can't let my dad down or my grandfather down, or so on and so forth. Um, that, that's what keeps me going, definitely. It's certainly not the paycheck. Although, you know, that, that goes in uh, fits and starts. But uh, my employees eat, so that's good. Mm -hmm. The investors have not, have not asked specifically about the impact we plan to make. Right? When we've talked to the investors, it's, will you make an impact? 
And if the answer is yes, then they can check the box. That's the investors that we've talked to. I'm not saying that everyone's obviously going to be the same. Um, when you're talking to maybe the Unreasonable Institute or Thousand Points of Light, uh, some of the social venture incubators, um, they will definitely uh, grill you a little bit harder in terms of how you plan to actually make an impact. Um, for us, we measure lives changed. That's at the end of each month, we look at the products sold. Um, we know before putting that product up on the site, whether it's part of a campaign or just our general marketplace, um, what the reaction is by the transaction. And so um, you're all familiar with Giving Tuesday? Some of you are, some of you are not. So Do Good By Us amongst um, the Salvation Army, Red Cross, 92nd Street Y, Microsoft, Skype, uh, and about 15 others were the founders of Giving Tuesday, a national day of giving back, uh, whether it be volunteering, donations, or shopping for good. Um, you could probably guess which one we led. Uh, pretty hilarious, though, when you go to the founding partners page and you see all the organizations I just named and Do Good By Us right there in the middle. It kind of feels pretty good to be in that kind of company. But it's the Tuesday after Thanksgiving, right? So you have your, uh, your Black Friday, Small Business Saturday, uh, Cyber Monday, and now a day giving back, right? Save a little bit on those days so that you can eventually uh, do good in the world. When we started Giving Tuesday about two months before the actual Giving Tuesday last year, our hope was to get about 200 organizations involved around the country. It's a movement, right? So we kind of gave the tools and the infrastructure. These 15 or so organizations provided the media coverage and, and some of the exposure. Um, but Giving Tuesday could be whatever you wanted it to be. And we threw, we threw the, uh, the official after party of Giving Tuesday at the 4040 Club. Jay-Z was there by accident, but he was there. <laughs> it's his club, so I guess he's allowed to do that. Um, and we announced at, at that party that over 2,500 organizations had signed up and participated in Giving Tuesday around the country, every single state. It was tweeted by the White House and President Obama. Um, pretty, pretty cool experience. So for you guys who work in an organization, either for-profit or non-profit, um, sign up, get involved. Uh, you know, what we have in store for this year is going to be much greater, and Megan, to answer your question. Last year, we, uh, through that day, found that we made a difference in 1,000 people's lives. This year, we're hoping to make that 5,000 people's lives. So again, through each sale, we know what the impact is uh, that we're making. And so we hope to 5x what we did last year. Yes. Um, did I answer your question, Megan? OK. Just to, uh, I guess, complement that question. So every single um, thing that's sold or campaign that you do, is that, can it always be quantified in lives change? And if so, um, could you guys actually have like, the answer is no, right? Because we can't change life until we hit that goal of 300 water bottles, let's say, okay. to build that water well. Um, so it, it, it's not always apples to apples. That's why we put the crowd commerce campaign in place, because ultimately the number of lives that we can impact through building a water well is tremendous, right? Um, and right, it's hard to quantify, except for maybe the people within that vicinity. Or, you know, But every project is going to be a little bit different. Um, the example with um, uh, the bug repellent, uh, I didn't use the bug repellent, but uh, sending the 12 women back to school on scholarship, right? That took about 800 bug sprays, uh, bug repellent, in order to send those 12 women back. So it's not always one-to-one. -one. And that's why we, again, came up with the crowd commerce campaign, because if someone's like, I bought one bug repellent, what's the impact that they're making, right? But now they can see what they have to do to achieve that goal. Yes. Having done a huge pivot and then like, not been happy with the outcome and then now doing lots of tiny ones, like how do you sniff test whether something is too big or too small? Like when you look at it, what do you are you looking for your gut feeling? Are you looking like is it all of your users asking for it? Like what do you specifically do? That's a tremendous question. And the answer is really in in my case my gut. Um, it's also a matter of analytics, right? My gut is where I start to sniff test, if you will. That's, that's when I start to go, huh, maybe there's a problem here because we're seeing drop off in our funnel. Or, um, you know, we 
through the analytics again are seeing that people visit this page, but they're not making it to the next one. What's, what's going on? Um, so that's, that's really how it gets the ball started. Um, experts is the second, right? So if someone says, well, I run an e-commerce site, and I found that a red button really does well for me. Well, I'm going to take that, and I'll put it into Optimizely, and I'll figure out whether or not red's going to work for us. When it's too big is really when every user is going to be affected by it, right? When I'm putting something on one page of the site, I'm only affecting the 100 or so people that are going to hit it. If I change um, the total navigation, uh, you know, that's something that's going to affect every single person that comes, and that's probably too big a change to make all at once. So yeah, when I, when I do changes to the navigation, I only do one button at a time. Uh, and then I let it sit there for about a week. And then I go back to the analytics and see if people are using it more or less than whatever it had been replaced by. Um, it's usually how it works. And then you just don't promise people anything in the strategy so that you can reverse it like, for your people you're working with. Like before you're going to do crowd raising, was it kind of like, did you run more pilots? Before? Yeah, um, Children's Miracle Network. Was, was our, I don't know if they knew it, but uh, we did. So uh, Children's Miracle Network, for those of you who, well, maybe, maybe not, but Children's Miracle Network, uh, their biggest fundraiser is through dance marathons. You probably have friends who participated in them across the country. Uh, they're at more than 100 and maybe 20 schools across the nation. Uh, we work with about 60. And so crowd commerce really started with Indiana University. Um, and we, we tried to work on this model with them, and it worked extremely well. And so we thought, OK, well, how do we apply this to others? How do we apply this you know, not to an event-based situation? Um, and that, that's how it came about. Yes? Um, so just a general suggestion. Like, having done a good amount of analytics, um, like, I find that the A-B testing, like the education with optimizing is great. But I think I, I found that um, testing specific sections, like with analytics, for example, with the mix panel, um, you know, yep. it, but like with mix panel, you can like track flow of um, like how somebody's following uh, certain, certain set of steps. Right? Mm -hmm. So like if you want them to get to check out um, a certain way, and you check, like, are they like, like how, are they taking more time in the second step, and why is that? And then you can even track, like, you know, did they go to the section and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. And I find, like, that really helps you, like, really figure out where people are at the columns. Um, I mean, like, optimizely and, you know, like, doing that type of stuff, A-B testing is awesome, but I find the analytics is where, like, you really get. Kissmetrics is another good one, right? There, there's, there's a ton of great tools out there. Um, some of them take a tremendous amount more um, technical ability. Uh, Kissmetrics, for example, you know, they want you to pay someone $500 and they'll implement it on your site. Sounds like you can do it on your own, but for uh, the vast majority of people, that might be either too much to figure out or too much to pay for a tool that they haven't tried yet. Um, Google Analytics or Optimizely. Optimizely, I think I pay less than $20 a month, and it was a one-click integration. So for a lot of people, that's, that's going to be the easiest way to go. But um, there are certainly no shortage of options, that's for sure. Cool. All right. One more question? No? All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. I, uh, again, hope you got something out of this. And there's my contact information. Um, I have a six-year-old at home, so don't call too late. But my phone number is there. Feel free to call during the day email with questions, and uh, um, I've got coupons and things here, so if you're interested for uh, the holiday season, 20% uh, off. All right, thanks, everyone.